Hello everyone, thank you for being there. We're out of doors this month, beginning our talk on family history research with a visit to Moseley, which is a little village hidden away in the Leicestershire countryside in the English Midlands. Welcome to Family Tree Talk, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands, with Malcolm Noble. The reason we're out of doors this month is I want to explore how we can get a feel of our ancestors' life by looking at the ground on which they lived. Now, not by using old documents and uh, looking at the old books, that's, I suppose that's a real work, but it does come later. Our research has identified the settlements where our ancestors came from, and when we visit those villages for the first time, how can we get a feel for their way of life just by looking at the world around them? I chose the subject for this month's episode when the historical novelist Rebecca de Marino popped into my tiny bookshop tucked away in Market Harbour's town centre. When she spoke about her feelings for Mosley, I knew that I was listening to just the sort of connectedness that had inspired my own family tree trek. I'd like to play you the edit of our conversation now. I began by asking Rebecca about her family connections with this little village in England. Well, uh, my ancestors came from Mousley in the 1600s, and uh, it was my ninth great-grandfather, uh, Barnabas Horton, and he was one of the founding fathers of South Hold, this Long Island. Be, uh... He sailed uh, between 1635 and 1638 see. Uh, during the Great Migration. Okay, how did all this start? Uh, I took my mother back to see a lighthouse that's named after Barnabas Horton on Long Island in 1999. Uh And we visited the Historical Society and the library and the museum at the lighthouse. And there was a lot of information about Barnabas. And not so much about his wife, Mary, who was my ninth great-grandmother. And I wondered about her. Um, Barnabas's grave is in the cemetery there that was right across from the house that he built, which was the first timber-framed house on eastern Long Island. And it has a three-by-five slab of blue slate that covers it, and the uh, epitaph was written by Barnabas himself. And it's still legible. It was relettered in the 1800s, and... We couldn't find Mary's grave. doesn't mean that she wasn't buried there. It means that her gravestone probably had disintegrated or had been destroyed somehow before they made church records. And when I got home, I kept thinking about Mary. Um, Barnabas was a widower with two little boys when she married him. And not too long after, they came across the ocean to a wild new land. And I thought that she must be quite courageous. She's mentioned in Barnabas's will, and uh, so I know she was still living at the time of his death. He wrote it uh, just a few weeks before he died, and she is also, it's not well documented, but I did find some references to the death of his first wife in 1629, and the fact uh, that she died in childbirth. And uh, he remarried within a year, uh, actually just a few months. And I haven't, I haven't found a wedding document, but... Uh, you know, it must be quite, I don't know, inspirational almost to come across um, something, some architecture with such a firm connection to one of your, your forefathers. It is. So how did we move from family history to novel writing? I'd always wanted to write a novel. (laughs) And uh, I never really knew what it would be about. To be honest, I thought I would be a suspense writer, contemporary suspense. 
and uh, but I just never had the time. I was raising three kids, and I would um, at my tenth high school reunion, I put down in my five year plan was to become a published author. Well, it took a lot longer, but when I went with my mother on that trip and I came home, I knew what I wanted my novel to be about, and it surprised me that I would be writing historical. <laughs> Um, it turned into a three-book series when I wrote my proposal for um, my agent. Um, I proposed it as a three-book series, and it sold as a three-book series. One of the things I'm interested in is, is how difficult it is to search UK history when you're on the other side of the pond. Well, originally it was very difficult. Um, finding anything online was... Uh, fairly non-existent in 2008. It was my brother who did most of the research, but he traced back to Barnabas. And what did you find out? Well, we know that he came from a wealthy family in uh, Mousley. The Hortons were considered a, a family of consequence there. However, there's quite a conundrum there because he was a baker by trade. And that I had to deal with in the first novel is this um, man that came from a wealthy family and yet he was a baker by trade. And it was kind of fun to work that twist into it and explain that one. But uh, he uh, was also um, remembered in later writings as being a jovial man that could fill a room when he walked in just by his presence. How did you come up with that? Someone in the 1920s um, actually did a correction of an earlier copy of Hortons in America. And it was originally written by George Horton, but there were what were considered errors. And Adeline Horton White actually compiled the information once again, correcting the errors. And that was uh, where I found that information. And the documentation about where that came down from is not there. So I assumed that that was an oral tradition. Is there a message in the novels? It does have a message. It, it's um, one of hope and uh, that um, God is always with us, that he knows the plans that he has for us, and that is not to harm us. And uh, it's inspirational historical romance. Um, so it it's one of hope, and um, it was pretty tricky. Barnabas was a Puritan, and they were rather harsh people at times, but I thought I wanted to find his humanness uh, and what it was that people found in him, because if he was um, considered a jovial, uh, likable person, then there was another side to him. So... Um, you always want your hero to be likable, and I found myself sometimes really struggling with that. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're all on this earth for a reason, and we're all capable of change, and Barnabas had his moment. <laughs> While I was researching the original book, I kept coming up with information about a very uh, interesting a Native American woman on Long Island from Montauk named Heather Flower, and I wanted to work her into that first book, but the time period didn't uh, work. So she became my heroine of book two, and um, so she's a, also a, a real person that existed written in a fiction uh, setting. A character from the first book who is Jeremy and is actually Barnabas's brother and was the uh, captain of the Swallow, the ship that they brought the Hortons over. Uh, he's a sea captain and he becomes my hero in the third book and the heroine is a fictitious char character from the first book as well. Now, we should explain to our listeners, Mosley is really more of a hamlet than a village. It, it, it's not a big place, is it? No. <laughs> it's very small. Anything like you imagined it? Actually, 
it's almost exactly like I imagined it because the I had found some ancient maps of Mousley and some of the roads uh, still bear the same name and uh, Dag Lane and Saddington Road. Uh, Saddington Road was in my first book and uh, the basic structure of the roads hasn't changed at all. Um, so it I also, um, a couple of years ago, went on Google Earth and actually walked the streets of Mousley and I saw the Staff of Life rest restaurant in St. Nicholas Church and it was like, wow. <laughs> so it just feels very comfortable to be there and there hasn't really been any surprises except for we visited the cemetery and it's about half filled with Hortons. <laughs> It's been amazing. They've been so nice. We were just over there today and visiting with a lady from the St. Nicholas, and uh, it feels like home to me. I feel a connection there that, um, like I sort of belong there. You're listening to Valley Tree Talk with Malcolm Noble, the podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. The details of Rebecca's books are linked to the show notes for tonight's podcast, and you'll find that on talkgenealogy.wordpress.com, along with details of the other books that I shall mention. Tonight, I want us to think about building in our minds the village that our ancestors would have recognised without necessarily trying to explain why it has a particular shape and why the posh houses were built in one part of the parish. That comes later, and yes, it's very important, but it's too tempting to rush on to that stage before we have properly exhausted what our own eyes can tell us. I know, I suspect that you're unlikely to divide your thoughts in that way, for after all, in every aspect of family history research, we are always looking for the new paths to research. But this podcast is for the genealogist with too much time on their hands. So, just let's take it steady and take things a little easier. Now, I always offer the warning that I'm neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an amateur who has spent 40 years, more than 40 years, digging up his family tree. And these podcasts are really just me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned. That is particularly relevant in tonight's podcast. The examples that I've chosen to highlight have always proved worthwhile to me. Now, when you look at an old parish, we're always told that the first thing to do is to strip away all the hedges. But just hold on. We would need to establish the history of enclosure in your village. And I would say it's more valuable rather than identify the hedges that your ancestor would not have recognised, but to clearly establish those hedges that they would have recognised. So we are looking for the old hedges. Now, there is a formula for doing this, a very disputed formula, I agree. But rather than try and detail it here, I have provided a link to that formula on the show notes for tonight's podcast. That's talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. Fundamentally, this theory is that we should take a 30-yard stretch of hedge and count the number of different species that are in that hedge. Now, to put that into context, when I did the research for tonight's podcast, I found that for goodness knows how many years, I've been using the wrong formula. But it is still quite effective, even if you get it wrong. By looking at the number of species in a decent stretch of hedge, we will be able to tell which are the ancient hedges that our forefathers would have recognised. Now, let's look at the roads. Yes, an important clue to further research is a simple message that every road is there for a reason. As I was told, all roads may not lead to Rome, but they certainly lead to somewhere. So, names like Mill Lane, or my favourite, Burnt House Lane, is always a prod to look at old maps. But again, I want to build the picture rather than explain it. Begin by thinking of them as trackways, 
rather than roads. Of course, they would have been unmade, and they would also have been narrower. Yeah, even the country lanes would have been more narrow in days gone by. The standard gauge for a cart was 4 feet 8.5 inches. That was a standard gauge, it wasn't universal, but it does show that there was really no need for the trackways to be much broader than that measurement. Now I've said we need to take care before we remove the hedges from the landscape, but what we can do certainly is remove the internal combustion engine. In a world without cars, where walking was not much slower than a cart, and certainly more convenient, the footpaths were just as important as the trackways. So get out your ordnance survey map, look for the footpaths and make them more important than they are today. When you look at the landscape, try to imagine that the footpaths are just as important as the trackways. How does that change what you're looking at? When you look at the roads, look for those sections that are likely to either break up or be flooded or be affected by the weather. Having looked at the hedges and the fields and the trackways, we now need to look at the buildings. And when you look for old buildings, if you don't have their history to hand, it's not a bad rule of thumb to employ the same approach as when you were looking for the age of a hedge. I have found that buildings repaired with different materials, those that look patched up, are often the older buildings. You're especially looking at the church, the manor house, which may be the main farmhouse. If you come across a hall, that's likely to be more recent. Most halls were actually built with new money during the Industrial Revolution. And of course you want to identify the main farms. There's probably about three or four of them. Try and identify the farm that was owned by the yeoman family of the village, because he's likely to be the most important chap. Any separate schoolhouse is likely to be fairly modern. It's unlikely to have been built before Victorian times and probably after 1870. Now, of course, when you're looking at buildings, the main source to go to is uh, Pesner, i.e. the Penguin Book of Buildings of England for the county in which you're interested. So having established the old buildings, hedgerows and track and footpaths, it's not a bad idea to sit in the churchyard and just sketch out your own map of how you think things were likely to have been. And now we come to what I think is often the most neglected and most important part of the survey, which is the lie of the land, because this is unlikely to have changed. Those parts of the land which are difficult to get to now are likely to have been difficult in the old days. Snow is likely to drift in the same way. I've only recently become properly interested in the history of weather as part of my family history research. So I can't say too much about it now, but, but I'm sure that weather history is a very neglected area of family history. What the weather did is likely to affect what our forefathers did. Okay, I hope that I've been able to illustrate just a little bit of the approach that I use when I'm uh, looking at a village for the first time. I hope you find it useful. Now, looking through my library, I've got together a few books which I'd like to recommend to you just uh, on tonight's subject. And as usual, I've uh, selected far too many, so I won't be able to mention them all. Um, one of the first books I ever read on this subject was Exploring Villages by Jocelyn Finberg. And, and I still read it, I still find it very enjoyable, and it is, uh, it's a very good overview of the sort of things that I've been talking about tonight. Uh, there are links to all these books on the website talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. The really important one is by W.G. Hoskins called The Midland Peasant. In fact, you could buy almost any work by Hoskins and you wouldn't be wasting your time. Uh, he's not quite as recognised now as he used to be. I think what it is is uh, people who follow, if you like, pure history... Um, who like to philosophise about it and um, in a very esoteric sort of way um, have criticised his work but as regards practical history actually doing it it is still very very useful and, um, and I'm certainly a fan of his 
Another person that I uh, enjoy reading is W.E. Tate, and I recommend The English Village Community by W.E. Tate. Uh, and I've put together a uh, an appreciation of W.E. Tate for a future podcast later on in the year, and I hope that's something to look forward to. Uh, if you want a good village history, uh, setting out also how you should do it and how you should research it, I recommend The Common Stream by Roland Parker. And then a little bit sideways to our theme, another enjoyable book is Victoria, sorry, Victorian Miniature by Owen Chadwick, which shows the tension uh, in a case study between um, the squire and the uh, chaplain and the local people which is a very good. So those are, I don't know, three or four books which I hope you will find useful. And of course, before we go, we need to ask about Rebecca's next book. There is a book number four, not about the Hortons. Um, Book number four, um, my agent actually wanted me to write, and I loved the idea, and it's about Dolly and James Madison. James Madison was the fourth president of the United States, and his wife, Dolly, is was the first um, wife of a president to be referred to as the first lady. Wasn't he on a $5,000 bill? Is it $5,000? I... No. Maybe. You haven't seen that many of those. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. <laughs> they did do a coin of Dolly, I think a, a dollar coin. Um, but they were kind of an unlikely couple. and uh, But they had a very unique love for each other. So the book is called The Love Story of Dolly and James. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for listening. I'm afraid we've run out of time for this month. I'd like to thank Rebecca de Marino for talking about her visit to England, Freeze Effects for the Royalty Free Music, and Emily Brooks for the voiceover, and to David W. for coming up with the idea for tonight's podcast. Once again, the show notes are at talkgenealogy.wordpress.com. I shall be posting another episode next month from 7.30 UK time on the third day of each month. I hope that you'll be there. In the meantime, good luck with your ancestor hunting. Good night, you, and God bless. Mm-hmm.